time to power up. Power up. Autobots, roll out. Broadcasting live from the DCR studio. Oh, yeah! The Geek Revolution starts here. Excellent! Get ready for the number one hit geek radio show out there. Well, it is impressive, isn't it? Because it's time for Dungeon Crawlers Radio. Let's get ready to rumble! And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of Dungeon Crawlers, where we have our wonderful guest, Nancy Cress. Which, if you haven't heard of her, I don't know why you haven't, because, well, she has six Nebulas, she has two Hugos, and the Sturgeon Award, Campbell Award. She's got several books out there, um, three books on writing, four uh, uh, short stories and uh, collections, and then the rest are just novels that she's written. Uh, We're here to talk about her latest book, which is actually out now, uh, which is If Tomorrow Comes, which is the second book in the Yesterday's Kin Trilogy. Uh, the first book was Tomorrow's Kin, so thank you for coming on the show to talk about this. Well, thank you for having me, Daniel. You're, you're welcome. Um, you know, science fiction and fantasy novels are my favorite to talk about. Uh, it's something I've always loved since a kid. Uh, you know, my, my first memories, of course, are Star Wars. I've always been a huge Star Wars fan, and from there, it just blossomed and continued on from there. And reading science fiction stories is always fun because it's, you know, it's it's a it's kind of like a look into the future and the possibilities of what humanity can or can't do, and it's it's always interesting to see how creative each different author is with that future. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this series? Uh, you know, yesterday's kin. Um, yes, I write a lot about genetic engineering, and in the first book of this series. Some aliens turn up on Earth, and it turns out that they are not all that alien. 140,000 years ago, they were taken off of Earth and placed on this other planet, which they call World, by some unknown entity. And they are actually our cousin, which is why they are yesterday's kin. They have come here to tell us that a spore cloud is drifting through space and that in about a year it's going to hit Earth, and that it contains spores that are deadly to human DNA, which, of course, they share. Um, Once they know where to look, our astronomers have no trouble finding the spore cloud, and then it's a race to see if they can develop some kind of antidote or vaccine or something. They They have samples of the spores with them, so there is something to work with. My major character in the first book is a geneticist, Marianne Jenner, who is part of the team that gets put together to see if they can approach this. She also has three very difficult older grown children who have various attitudes on this. And there are also a lot of people on Earth that don't want the aliens here. They don't believe the spore cloud, and some of them don't believe it. Some of them think when it does hit, it's going to be that aliens have sent it themselves because they insist on calling them aliens, even though all tissue samples and DNA samples show that they are in fact human okay so the first book ends with the spore cloud hitting the second book or it doesn't end there it hits and then there's an aftermath on them in the second book which is coming out today if tomorrow comes the terrans have built a spaceship according to plans they left us and we are going to world to their planet to try to make further contact with our cousins here. Hopefully there will be trade possibilities. The people that are going, there's only about 22 of them because the plans they gave us for spaceship is pretty small. But when they get there, they don't find anything that they expected. I'm not gonna tell you what they do find because of course I want you to read the book, but I will say, I will say that I have four main point of view characters, Aunt Marianne, a doctor, one of the Terrans who went on the first expedition back to world and has been living there ever since. And my favorite character to write, which was a real stretch for me, Daniel, he's an ex-army ranger and an army sniper. 
in order to write a 24 year old male ex ranger, I had to do a lot of research. I read memoirs by rangers. I read online about rangers. I read the entire rangers handbook and I can now build a field antenna should you require me to do this. And then when I had finished, I hired an ex-ranger to read the manuscript and tell me if I had made a fool of myself or not. And he was very, very helpful. I was pleased both that he discovered things that I needed to rewrite and that there weren't too many things that I needed to rewrite, which suggests yeah. my research was good in the first place. Well, no, I, I think that's great that you took that extra step in researching that. Well, that was going to be one of my questions is, how was it to try to write these, you know, rangers that were sent with this group to protect them? Because, it's again, I struggle with trying to write a female character and their perspective because I, I don't think like one. So I have to, you know, talk to other uh, women and stuff like that to try to get that, that sense and idea uh, of that personality or their thought process. So it, I like the fact you took that extra step and had someone reread it even after doing all that research. Yeah, I think writing the other when it's an actual other, not an alien you're inventing, yeah. but another race, another gender, another occupation, even another age group is a challenge. But I also think it's a worthwhile challenge. I don't belong to the school, which I'm afraid is pretty prevalent in science fiction right now, that says you don't try to write from another point of view of somebody who's completely different from you. Um, I think if you do it respectfully and you really make a lot of effort and then you check it um, with people who belong to that group, that it enriches fiction and that you may even be able to bring something extra as an outsider in perception. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think it's fun to be able to do that. You know, you kind of get to step out of yourself and, be in that person's shoes as you're writing and uh, it's kind of sad that that persona or that idea of don't write outside is kind of becoming prevalent because I, I can't tell you the number of authors I've read growing up and throughout the years where they have you know written as another culture or another gender or something like that and they've done a fantastic job. Yeah, I got very fond of Leo Brody, my my ranger, my ex ranger, who's an army sniper. Um, I really did. He's he's not the brightest young man on the planet. He's bright enough, but he's 24. He's more interested in having a good time at this point than anything else. But throughout the book, he has to mature because circumstances force him to. Yeah. No, and, and that's how any 20 year old, you know, in their early 20s, is they're impetuous they they just want to have fun they don't realize that there are other things that come into play like uh you know responsibilities and stuff but you put them into a a situation and i i like to think that us as humans you know immediately go wow i need to mature or i need to become responsible or something and grow otherwise i'm just going to die or something worse I don't even know if we if we say I need to grow. We just get forced willy nilly into it. I look back at myself at twenty, and sometimes I cringe at the things I remember doing. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm there with you. Uh, it's I'm just like, why did I do that? You know. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting. Well, let alone besides the fact, just growing as an individual. There's things that you look back and you're like. Like, I've suddenly developed a fear of heights. I've never been afraid of heights, you know. I remember climbing trees, rock climbing, all this. Now uh, I could be on the fifth level of a mall that has a railing and look down, and I suddenly am, like, get that fear and that shaking, like, I'm going to topple over. And it's like, what the heck is wrong with me? Really? <laughs> yeah. It's been interesting. So, yeah. I'm, I'm, I thought that was something you either started out with or – I didn't know you would develop it as, I mean, I don't know how old you are, but you have a 15-year-old a daughter, so you're obviously well, I, not 20. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm 40. So, uh, you know, it's just something that's happened over the last few years. It's weird, the weirdest thing. Um, but I'm fine with heights, but I don't like tunnels. Oh, okay. 
tunnels. I was I was once in a cab with a friend going through Lincoln Tunnel from Newark Airport into Manhattan. And I was very tense and she knew it. So she was holding my hand and she was talking to the cab driver, hoping for reassurance. And she was saying, now these tunnels never collapse. And he's going, oh, no, 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 it's triple construction. He goes through this long thing. And my friend is nodding at me. See, see. And then when he finishes, he says, but fires, we get a fire in here and it's awful. Oh. And immediately I fell apart. Oh. All over <laughs> Just stop while you're ahead. Um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. You get fires in here all the time. Yeah. See, see that's scary. I mean, you, there's nowhere I, to go. You know, if there's a no. fire, you're you're kind of stuck in a tunnel. So yeah, and all the oxygen gets used up, and then you're really in trouble. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't like tunnels, even short ones. I can do them, but I don't like them. Yeah. I. You know, but there's great material there for a story. Um. So yeah. I did actually use it in a previous book. I have nice. a character who has to go through a narrow tunnel and gets stuck, and I tell you, just writing that scene, which occurs in a book called Probability Moon. I was sweating just writing the scene. Okay. Uh, well, and that's definitely, in my opinion, when I'm writing, when I'm feeling that, I feel anxiety or feeling emotion, I'm definitely getting it right. So, I mean, if you were sweating, then you, you probably hit it on, on the head. Um, you could probably do a really good scene from somebody stuck on the top of a tall building. Yeah, I, I could. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's just weird. I mean, I, I, I remember, like I said, I remember experiences, rock climbing, uh, being at the top of a cliff, looking down, thinking that was off, cliff diving, no problem. Now I get queasy. It's it's the weirdest thing. I don't, I don't know. But I can definitely, I'm from memory, can write it from both perspectives of being the fearless person uh, to being the person that's scared out of their pants. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we use our memories in very interesting ways when we write. Um, I teach a lot writing, and I tell my students, I know you've never committed a murder, and then I really hope that I'm right, but you've probably been angry enough to want to kill somebody. That's the feeling you have to tap into when you write somebody committing murder. You have to take the feelings that you have and amplify them, and you have to pay attention to how they affected your body initially, and try to get that in the prose so that you're not just saying, I felt angry. What does anger feel like? Give it to me. Try to remember it. Yeah. No, that's what I try to focus on. Um, so I'm glad to know the things I'm doing are things that you're teaching. That's <laughs> fantastic. Um, yeah, I teach every year. Well, I teach a lot, but I teach every year with Walter John Williams, a two-week intensive workshop called Taos Toolbox that we teach in New Mexico. And it's uh, it's structured like Clarion. It's a critique workshop. We also have lectures and, and exercises and stuff. And it gets very intense because all of these people are serious about writing science fiction. And we do a lot of critiquing and um, all of them improve. Well, that's, uh, and that's the expected goal, I mean, or at least the hope of the expected goal. So my question is, what got you into wanting to write science fiction? I mean, most people have a different answer, but what is yours? It was an accident. Okay. <laughs> that, I, it, that makes it sound like I tripped over it. But I had loved to read science fiction, mm -hmm. but I'd always loved to read everything. And I never planned on being a writer. I know people who say, oh, I knew by the age seven I wanted to be a writer. Well, I didn't. Um, when I was age seven, first of all, I thought all writers were dead. I didn't know that it was more of it was being produced. I thought it was a finite resource like oil. Mm -hmm. Because the writers that I looked at as I got a little older, Louisa May Alcott and Zane Gray, were all dead. Um, the reason I started writing was because I was pregnant with my second child, stuck way out in the country without a car, no other women my age at home on, this, on the road, and I was going crazy. And when the baby was napping, I started writing to have something you do that didn't involve Sesame Street. And it came out science fiction. I don't know why. And I kept on with it. But it was sort of an accidental kind of thing. If I had lived in a more populated area, I don't know if I ever would have tried if I'd had more company or stimulation or an easier pregnancy. Yeah. 
Well, it just seems like it was the perfect uh, storm in in a way that led you there. It felt like a storm too. Yeah, I, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, I, I know how rough pregnancies and children can be, and uh, you know, I, I know what it's like to be isolated. Um, I lived in a small town uh, in my early 20s, and it drove me nuts. Uh, you know, it was like now this wasn't this wasn't a small town. This was way way out in the country. Well, um, you couldn't walk to anything. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess my considerate of small town, uh, it was like 20 minutes, a 20 minute drive to the closest fast food place. So, uh, <laughs> you know, by the time I drove there and back, my food was cold more than half yeah. the time. But, uh, yeah, yeah it, it's, it is a difference in living and it gives you a different perspective. Yeah, it does. And I had grown up in the country, but there's a difference between living in the country as a child, ranging around the woods mm -hmm. and being stuck there as a young mother with no car. Yeah. I had not taken that into account. <laughs> now I live in the city of Seattle and I'm surrounded by coffee shops and restaurants and all kinds of things I can walk to. And a wonderful fish market. And yes. Yeah. Uh, I love going to Seattle. Uh, my parents actually used to live up there and I'd always stop in the market. Um, Emerald City Comic Con is fantastic. And that was just this last weekend. So. It is. And there's a thriving science fiction community here. We have a lot of writers. Ted Chang, Brenda Cooper, Greg Baer, Vonda McIntyre. There's a lot of writers here and we all know each other. So you get a lot of support and sympathy and understanding of the industry ups and downs. Nice. So how have you survived those industry ups and downs? I mean, you have a lot of novels out there. I mean, the 28 now. Uh, this book is out, and what has allowed you to survive those industries' ups and downs and ebbs and flows, and you never know if the next book is going to spark, or it's not book, next series is going to spark with your fans? Um, what keeps you going? No, you never do. And I have made, I suppose, some mistakes from the point of view of somebody who was trying to build a brand, because most of my books differ a lot from each other. Okay. And having found, for instance, a series of space opera fans with the Probability series, I then stopped writing space opera and wrote something entirely different. And, of course, they were not happy because that isn't what they expected. And I've done that over and over again. But, you know, I don't regret it because every time I've written something, it's because I was excited about writing that thing. And even though I think this has cost me in terms of a consistency and a consistent fan base that wanted a certain kind of thing from me. Um, I don't regret it because what has kept me going, and I suppose what's kept me viable as a writer, is that I write what I care about at the time that I'm writing about it. Okay. I always fall a little bit in love with my characters, and I always am interested, if not passionate, about whatever the theme of, of what I'm writing is. So what that does is, even though you may have times where books fail and you lose money, or they might not even sell, it keeps you interested enough to keep going on to the next project. Okay. No, I, I like that. You know, you're, it's the passion that they detect, I guess is what you're saying. Yeah, I have students who sometimes say, you know, or actually not students so much as fellow writers, and I'm not going to name any names, but Fine. they say, follow the money. Look, what, look what's selling. Follow the money. Build your brand. Mm -hmm. And I say, don't follow the money. Follow your heart. You won't end up as rich, but, <laughs> but you'll, you'll be staying in the game longer and you'll be happier. Yeah, I, I've heard that as well. You know, build your brand, you know, do where the market goes and whatever. And I'm just, I've thought several times, but what about what I love writing about? What about what I love doing? Right. Uh, I, I feel like that kind of, gets rid of that whole, you know, that's the reason I wrote, because I really loved the story that I was writing. I loved doing it, the process. But if I'm following the money, it's like, am I loving what I'm doing now? Because, oh, now zombies are hot. I don't like zombies. Or I mean, just, yeah. Yeah, I don't like zombies either. My first three books were fantasy. And then I had built up a sort of a little following in fantasy. And then I switched to science fiction. And I don't really know why, except that the next book I wanted to write was science fiction. 
So I built up a science fiction following, and then I wrote two thrillers. And they got very well reviewed, including the New York Times, but they did not sell well because my name was on them. So bookstores shelved them with the science fiction, and they're not science fiction, they're thrillers. Mm -hmm. And the thriller audience never found them because they were shelved with science fiction. Yeah. So that wasn't good either. But those were the books I wanted to write. And this kind of thing has happened over and over again. But I, again, I really don't regret it. Hmm. And that's, I, I guess that is the, the good thing. You don't regret it. You enjoy what you do. And for those of you that like thrillers, go find them. Uh, they might be in the <laughs> science fiction section. They're called Oaths and Miracles and um, Stinger. I think they're both out of print, but you can find them online at Amazon. Yeah. So where did the idea for this series come from? I mean, these spores coming from space are going to wipe out humanity and this race shows up and you find out, hey, these are our cousins. I, I, where did this come from? You know, that's a good question, but I don't have a really good answer. Okay. When I start a book, I usually have a character and a situation, but I don't have the whole thing. And when I started this, I wanted to write about Marianne Jenner, who's a middle-aged with three grown children, um, geneticist who teaches at a college in upstate New York, which I have done. And I had her in mind. And the first scene, as always happens with my first scene, writes itself pretty easily. And then I stop and I think, okay, where is this going from here? And I think two questions guide all fiction. And they certainly help me when I'm thinking about where does this go from here. And the questions are, what do all these people want? And you have to know that. You have to know what each of your characters wants at every stage, because it may change. And it will be their motivation. And you also have to ask, what can go wrong? Because fiction is about stuff that gets screwed up. Yeah. Nobody wants to read a 400-page novel where everything goes well. So you have characters who want stuff. Sometimes they even want conflicting stuff. And then you have stuff going wrong, and you f I feel my way through the plot as, as I do that. And as for where individual plot elements come from, it's hard to say. I think with a pen in my hand or a keyboard, pen, a pen and clipboard if I'm um, stuck, keyboard if I'm not, and that seems to get the juices flowing, and it sort of comes to me. That's an unsatisfactory answer, but it's the only one I have. Honestly, that's that's a great answer. That's exactly how I am when I'm writing. So mm -hmm. I have the idea. I just go and I let the story come out. Um, uh, Tony Morrison said, I write in order to find out what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably true of me, too. Yeah. I, I've tried doing the outlining and all that, and I, I feel like the story is more forced, and it doesn't come out as well as if I just kind of let it come out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, no, your answer sounds great, <laughs> and I approve and accept it. <laughs> well, thank you. It's the only one I've got. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else out there will, but that's okay. I mean, that's the fantastic thing about writing is everyone does it differently, and we still get these fantastic stories that come out of the different processes. Yeah, to quote Rudyard Kipling, there are nine and 60 ways to construct the tribal lays, and every single one of them is right. I love that quote. <laughs> now, since since you do teach writing, um, what advice would you give an up and coming writer that is struggling with themselves, where they feel like they're doing a good job, but they just don't feel like they're getting it right? Well, there's a couple things. First of all, look at structure. Your fiction has a certain structure. Mm -hmm. You absorb it by osmosis if you read enough, but you still have to look at it. Um, it is constructed in a, such a way that tension should mount through the whole book, and then it should all come to a climax near the end. And there are other points along the way. But you should look at structure because a good structure for a, an exciting story will actually have a better chance of selling, even if it has mediocre prose. I'm sorry to say this, but it's true. Even if it has mediocre prose 
and stereotypical characters, then will something with gorgeous prose and interesting characters if there isn't a forward momentum and a structure. Mm -hmm. So structure is what you need to pay a lot of attention to, and a lot of beginning writers don't want to. They feel that it's formulaic, it's imposing something on them. But it really isn't, because in my view, structure, which is only story, is built into the human mind. Story is the way we experience the world. And it's the way that mores and beliefs evolve that guide us. It's the way that language developed when Og the caveman was telling the story about the mammoth he slew down by the water hole. It's a story. Mm -hmm. It's a brief one. And that's how we experience the world. So I, I would advise beginning writers to read about structure, think about structure, um, get feedback on your structure if, if it seems to be wobbly. Take a class that's taught by a good writer. Get some beta readers whose opinion you trust and see what they think about the way the story is developing structure-wise. Mm, great advice. I like that. Um, yeah, I, I have to agree with you. Even if the story is kind of, you know, the characters are not always there, That, but if you feel like you're being pulled through the story and you can't put it down, I love this. I love reading stories like that, even though, you know, they may not be the greatest book out there. It's still a great read because I can't put it down. Yes. Ideally, of course, there are also wonderful characters and sparkling prose. Yes. But, but you can't always have the ideal. Yeah. So with this book out, you know, I, I'm guessing you're going to have signings or events where you're going to be at. Where can the listeners find you? Well, if you're in Seattle, tonight I'm reading at the University Bookstore. Um, this weekend I will be at the Tucson Book Fair in Arizona, and I will be doing things there, including teaching a one-hour workshop and writing in scenes. Um, I will also be at the San Diego Comic Fest, not the big Comic-Con, but the smaller Comic Fest, which is a little more literary, okay. um, next month. And I will be doing local readings around Seattle and Portland, Oregon in the, in the next, pretty much throughout the next month. And then I will be going to DC in the fall to Cap Clave where I'm guest of honor. And in July 5th through 8th, I'm guest of honor at Westercon in Denver. And I will be at all those places doing signings and readings. Nice. Yeah, I like conventions. I really do. I, I enjoy seeing old friends. I enjoy the, the sort of weird atmosphere that prevails at science fiction conventions. I like the panels. I even like the dumber fights that you get into um, <laughs> on panels. You know, I, I love being on panels. You know, Even if for some reason you get off topic of what they're saying it is, for some reason they're still – wisdom and that that gets imparted whether i'm sitting on one or i'm actually listening to one i just love listening to panels they're fantastic yeah. and i you know over the years i've gleaned enough information and that's what really got me excited and had that i mean i wanted to write long long ago but was told shouldn't do that because it's not a paying job and i needed to get a real job so i let that happen but then a after hearing these panels and that i just like oh i really would love to do this and w one of these authors said you could do this go ahead and do it and i did it uh, well that's wonderful congratulations well, thanks. again thanks. yeah and, I, I i find conventions very energizing too yeah no and, and it's ex well I, even if you don't sell any books just someone picking up one book and being excited about the book it's just it makes it all worth it at least in my opinion you know what just one person you know, yeah, it would be awesome to sell thousands and hundreds of thousands, but knowing that one person is enjoying your story is just, I, in my opinion, reward enough. Well, it's a reward. I don't know if it's reward enough. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm greedier than you are. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I mean, yes, everyone loves money. Everyone loves getting a paycheck. I, I will. It isn't that. even the money. It's that I want the readers. Yeah. I want people to read this stuff. I yeah. wrote it. I want them to read it. Yeah. 
And the best way to know that is by seeing that monetary value coming in, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I love having or knowing that people are loving the story. Yes, that's what makes it worthwhile. So, all right. Since book two is out, everyone can get book one, which means you can get both of them. Might as well. It's a twofer. Uh, so that when book three comes out, you guys know what's going on. Plus, the amazing stuff is if you've never read any of Nancy's stuff, she has an enough back catalog that if you've got done with one and two, waiting for three, you can go back and read the other stuff. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yes, you can. And uh, I hope that they will. Yes, I, I mm -hmm. hope you guys do too. Uh, the cover art is really interesting and fantastic. So I don't know who you guys got for the artist, but I love, like on the book one, you know, you got Statue of Liberty, you've got this alien spaceship, you've got choppers flying around it, and uh, I'm not sure what building that is. Um, it's a embassy that the aliens have landed in New York Harbor. Okay. And uh, it's their ship, and it's floating in New York Harbor. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be highly restricted. And it is in some ways, but in other ways it's not. And I, the cover for book two um, is nice too, but I wouldn't actually know this because Tor has not yet sent me my books. Oh. So I'm, the author's always the last to know. So <laughs> I am going to have to read tonight from the manuscript rather than from an actual book since I don't have any. Oh, well, Tor, get on it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it definitely, I mean, the second book, it looks like an alien landscape. It's definitely different. It's orange. It's vibrant. And then you have this kind of globe uh, type ship, I'm guessing, that's starting to land. Um, it, I think that's appropriate. Yeah, it's the definitely second, very eye-catching. Yeah, the first book takes place on Earth, the second book on World, and then the third book, they're back on Earth. Okay. So it's a journey and return motif. I like that. That is and it's orange because that world circles an orange star, an okay. orange dwarf star. Hmm. Ooh, that's going to be interesting. So how does that affect the humans? Uh, now I got Now I definitely have to read to find out. <laughs> well, they have picked a, a planet to plant these transplanting humans on that obviously can support them. Okay. But the light is different. The foliage is different. Um, there are... I, I try very hard when I create an alien planet to make it believable, to pick a viable star, to put the planet at a distance that could support life in the Goldilocks zone, mm -hmm. to work out the geography and the air pressure, the atmosphere, the um, sunlight, the amount of sunlight and what kind of plants will flourish there, the proportion of water to earth. I work out all this stuff ahead of time because the more of this you can do ahead of time, the fewer mistakes you'll make and the less rewriting you have to do later on. Yeah, no, that is fantastic, and I agree. Uh, but that's just amazing. How, do you go talk with scientists or something like that to kind of figure out where that Goldilocks zone would be comparable to the different stars, or is that just something you research online? Well, neither one. Um, okay. A while ago, Poole Anderson... And um, I can't remember who the other author is. Stephen, I can't remember his name. Anyway, they wrote a book, a pamphlet, How to Build a Planet, which you can get from Amazon. And it goes through all of the astronomy, starting with picking an appropriate star, and then how you figure out all of the rest of these things so that you have a viable planet. There is a lot of math, and some of the math I can't follow, but I can follow enough of the part that is not mathematical in order to, again, construct a planet that is believable. So if you're interested in writing hard SF, in which the science actually does make sense, um, How to Build a Planet by Poole Anderson and Stephen Gillette, now I got it, is something that you probably want to have in your library. Okay. Well, there you heard it, everyone. Get those in your <laughs> library, besides Nancy's books, because that's important, too. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I really appreciate your time today. It's been fantastic talking with you. Uh, everyone, please go pick up uh, copies of these books. And, you know, if you enjoy it, pick up copies of uh, her other books because we love supporting authors. And you know, th that's the best way 
to support them is by picking up their books, and then that shows the publishers that you want more. Well, thank you for having me, Daniel. I've enjoyed it. You're welcome. Um, so with that said, everyone, uh, like I said, pick up a copy, and we'll catch you next time. Bye. You're listening to Dungeon Crawlers Radio. Please subscribe and follow them on Facebook or Twitter, precious. No, we're even promoting these filthy idiots. Who doesn't like them? Who doesn't like anyone? They're our friends, precious. They're our friends. No, shut up. Please subscribe.